Part Five, Chapter Two of O Pioneers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. O Pioneers by Willa Cather, Part Five, Alexandra, Chapter Two. Late in the afternoon of a brilliant October day, Alexandra Bergson, dressed in a black suit and travelling hat, alighted at the Burlington depot in Lincoln. She drove to the Lindell Hotel, where she had stayed two years ago when she came up for Emil's commencement. In spite of her usual air of sureness and self-possession, Alexandra felt ill at ease in hotels, and she was glad when she went to the clerk's desk to register. That there were not many people in the lobby, she had her supper early, wearing her hat and black jacket down to the dining room and carrying her handbag. After supper, she went out for a walk. It was growing dark when she reached the university campus. She did not go into the grounds, but walked slowly up and down the stone walk, outside the long iron fence, looking through at the young men who were running from one building to another. At the lights shining from the armory and the library, a squad of cadets were going through their drill behind the armory, and the commands of their young officer rang out at regular intervals, so sharp and quick that Alexandra could not understand them. Two stalwart girls came down the library steps and out through one of the iron gates. As they passed her, Alexandra was pleased to hear them speaking Bohemian to each other. Every few moments, a boy would come running down the flagged walk and dash out into the street as if he were rushing to announce some wonder to the world. Alexandra felt a great tenderness for them all. She wished one of them would stop and speak to her. She wished she could ask them whether they had known Emil. As she lingered by the south gate, she actually did encounter one of the boys. He had on his drill cap and was swinging his books at the end of a long strap. It was dark by this time. He did not see her and ran against her. He snatched off his cap and stood bareheaded and panting. "I'm awfully sorry," he said in a bright, clear voice, with a rising inflection, as if he expected her to say something. "Oh, it was my fault," said Alexandra eagerly. "Are you an old student here? May I ask?" No, ma'am. I'm a freshie, just off the farm, Cherry County. Were you hunting somebody? No, thank you. That is, Alexandra wanted to detain him. That is, I would like to find some of my brother's friends. He graduated two years ago. Then you'd have to try the seniors, wouldn't you? Let's see. I don't know any of them yet, but there's sure to be some of them around the library. That red building right there. He pointed. Thank you. I'll try there," said Alexandra lingeringly. "Oh, that's all right. Good night." The lad clapped his cap on his head and ran straight down Eleventh Street. Alexandra looked after him wistfully. She walked back to her hotel unreasonably comforted. What a nice voice that boy had, and how polite he was! I know Emil was always like that to women. And again, after she had undressed and was standing in her nightgown, brushing her long, heavy hair by the electric light, she remembered him and said to herself, "I don't think I ever heard a nicer voice than that boy had. I hope he will get on well here, Cherry County. That's where the hay is so fine, and the coyotes can scratch down to water." At nine o'clock the next morning, Alexandra presented herself at the warden's office in the state penitentiary. The warden was a German, a ruddy, cheerful-looking man who had formerly been a harness maker. Alexandra had a letter to him from the German banker in Hanover. As he glanced at the letter, Mr. Schwartz put away his pipe. "That big Bohemian is it? Sure, he's getting along fine," said Mr. Schwartz cheerfully. "I'm glad to hear that. I was afraid he might be quarrelsome and get himself into more trouble." Mr. Schwartz, if you have time, I would like to tell you a little about Frank Shabata and why I am interested in him. 
The warden listened genially while she told him briefly something of Frank's history and character, but he did not seem to find anything unusual in her account. "'Sure, I'll keep an eye on him. We'll take care of him all right,' he said, rising. "'You can talk to him here while I go to see to things in the kitchen. I'll have him sent in. He ought to be done washing out his cell by this time. We have to keep him clean, you know.' The warden paused at the door, speaking back over his shoulder to a pale young man in convict's clothes, who was seated at a desk in the corner, writing in a big ledger. "'Bertie, when 1037 is brought in, you just step out and give this lady a chance to talk.' The young man bowed his head, and bent over his ledger again. When Mr. Schwartz disappeared, Alexandra thrust her black-edged handkerchief nervously into her handbag. Coming out on the street-car she had not had the least dread of meeting Frank, but since she had been here the sounds and smells in the corridor, the look of the men in convict's clothes who passed the glass door of the warden's office, affected her unpleasantly. The warden's clock ticked, the young convict's pen scratched busily in the big book, and his sharp shoulders were shaken every few seconds by a loose cough which he tried to smother. It was easy to see that he was a sick man. Alexandra looked at him timidly, but he did not once raise his eyes. He wore a white shirt under his striped jacket, a high collar, and a necktie, very carefully tied. His hands were thin and white and well cared for, and he had a seal-ring on his little finger. When he heard steps approaching in the corridor, he rose, blotted his book, put his pen in the rack, and left the room without raising his eyes. Through the door he opened, a guard came in, bringing Frank Shabata. "'You the lady that wanted to talk to 1037? Here he is. Be on your good behavior now. He can set down, lady.' Seeing that Alexandra remained standing, "'Push that white button when you're through with him, and I'll come.' The guard went out, and Alexandra and Frank were left alone. Alexandra tried not to see his hideous clothes. She tried to look straight into his face, which she could scarcely believe was his. It was already bleached to a chalky grey. His lips were colourless, his fine teeth looked yellowish. He glanced at Alexandra sullenly, blinked as if he had come from a dark place, and one eyebrow twitched continually. She felt at once that this interview was a terrible ordeal to him. His shaved head— showing the conformation of his skull, gave him a criminal look which he had not had during the trial. Alexandra held out her hand. Frank, she said, her eyes filling suddenly, I hope you'll let me be friendly with you. I understand how you did it. I don't feel hard toward you. They were more to blame than you. Frank jerked a dirty blue handkerchief from his trousers pocket. He had begun to cry. He turned away from Alexandra. "'I never did mean to do nothing to that woman,' he muttered. "'I never mean to do nothing to that boy. I ain't had nothing again that boy. I always liked that boy fine. And then I find him—' He stopped. The feeling went out of his face and eyes. He dropped into a chair and sat looking stolidly at the floor, his hands hanging loosely between his knees, the handkerchief lying across his striped leg. He seemed to have stirred up in his mind a disgust that had paralyzed his faculties. "'I haven't come up here to blame you, Frank. I think they were more to blame than you.' Alexandra, too, felt benumbed. Frank looked up suddenly and stared out of the office window. "'I guess that place I'll go to hell what I work so hard on,' he said with a slow, bitter smile. "'I not care a damn.' He stopped and rubbed the palm of his hand over the light bristles on his head with annoyance. "'I no can tink without my hair,' he complained. "'I forget English. We not talk here except swear.' Alexandra was bewildered. Frank seemed to have undergone a change of personality. There was scarcely anything by which she could recognize her handsome bohemian neighbor. He seemed, somehow, not altogether human. She did not know what to say to him. "'You do not feel hard to me, Frank?' she asked at last. Frank clenched his fist and broke out in excitement. "'I not feel hard at no woman. 
I tell you I'm not that kind of man. I never hit my wife. No, I never hurt her when she devil me something awful. He struck his fist down on the warden's desk so hard that he afterward stroked it absently. A pale pink crept over his neck and face. Two, three years ago I know dat woman don't care no more about me, Alexander Bergson. I know she after some other man. I know her, ooh, ooh, and I ain't never hurt her. I never would a done dat if I ain't had dat gun along. I don't know what in hell make me take dat gun. She always say I ain't no man to carry gun. If she been in dat house where she ought a been, but dat's a foolish talk. Frank rubbed his head and stopped suddenly, as he had stopped before. Alexandra felt that there was something strange in the way he chilled off, as if something came up in him that extinguished his power of feeling or thinking. Yes, Frank, she said kindly. I know you never meant to hurt Marie. Frank smiled at her queerly. His eyes filled slowly with tears. You know, I most forget that woman's name. She ain't got no name for me no more. I never hate my wife, but that woman what make me do that? Honest to God, but I hate her. I no man to fight. I don't want to kill no boy and no woman. I not care how many men she take under dat tree. I no care for nothing but dat fine boy I kill, Alexander Bergson. I guess I go crazy, sure enough. Alexandra remembered the little yellow cane she had found in Frank's clothes closet. She thought of how he had come to this country a gay young fellow, so attractive that the prettiest bohemian girl in Omaha had run away with him. It seemed unreasonable that life should have landed him in such a place as this. She blamed Marie bitterly. And why, with her happy, affectionate nature, should she have brought destruction and sorrow to all who had loved her, even to poor old Joe Tavesky, the uncle who used to carry her about so proudly when she was a little girl? That was the strangest thing of all. Was there, then, something wrong in being warm-hearted and impulsive like that? Alexandra hated to think so. But there was Emil, in the Norwegian graveyard at home, and here was Frank Shabata. Alexandra rose and took him by the hand. "'Frank Shabata, I am never going to stop trying until I get you pardoned. I'll never give the governor any peace. I know I can get you out of this place.' Frank looked at her distrustfully, but he gathered confidence from her face. Alexandra, he said earnestly, if I get out of here, I not trouble this country no more. I go back where I came from, see my mother. Alexandra tried to withdraw her hand, but Frank held on to it nervously. He put out his finger and absently touched a button on her black jacket. Alexandra, he said in a low tone, looking steadily at the button. You ain't tink I used that girl awful bad before. No, Frank, we won't talk about that, Alexandra said, pressing his hand. I can't help Emil now, so I'm going to do what I can for you. You know I don't go away from home often, and I came up here on purpose to tell you this. The warden at the glass door looked in inquiringly. Alexandra nodded, and he came in and touched the white button on his desk. The guard appeared, and with a sinking heart Alexandra saw Frank led away down the corridor. After a few words with Mr. Schwartz, she left the prison and made her way to the street-car. She had refused with horror the warden's cordial invitation to go through the institution. As the car lurched over its uneven roadbed, back toward Lincoln, Alexandra thought of how she and Frank had been wrecked by the same storm, and of how, although she could come out into the sunlight, she had not much more left in her life than he. She remembered some lines from a poem she had liked in her school days. Henceforth the world will only be a wider prison-house to me. And sighed. A disgust of life weighed upon her heart. Some such feeling as had twice frozen Frank Shabata's features while they talked together. She wished she were back on the divide. When Alexandra entered her hotel, the clerk held up one finger and beckoned to her. As she approached his desk, he handed her a telegram. Alexandra took the yellow envelope and looked at it in perplexity, then stepped into the elevator without opening it. As she walked down the corridor toward her room, she reflected that she was, in a manner, immune from evil tidings. 
On reaching her room she locked the door, and, sitting down on a chair by the dresser, opened the telegram. It was from Hanover, and it read, Arrived Hanover last night. Shall wait here until you come. Please hurry. Carl Lindstrom Alexandra put her head down on the dresser and burst into tears. End of chapter 2 of part 5